Este, primero que nada, en nombre del doctor Manuel Ruiz de Chávez, presidente del Consejo de la Comisión Nacional de Bioética, pues les damos la bienvenida a los que se encuentran aquí con nosotros en la sala, como los que tendrán la oportunidad de ver esta teleconferencia posteriormente, ya que para la Comisión Nacional de Bioética es realmente un honor el poder contar con la presencia del doctor James Dwyer. Este, el doctor Dwyer es doctor en filosofía por la Universidad de California en Irving y actualmente es profesor asociado del Centro de Bioética y Humanidades y del Departamento de Salud Pública y Medicina Preventiva en la Universidad del Estado de Nueva York. El doctor Dwyer es miembro de la Asociación Internacional de Bioética, asimismo coordina la Red de Bioética Ambiental de dicha asociación. Además de sus actividades académicas, el doctor participa en el servicio de consultoría en ética del Hospital de la Upstate Medical University. Su investigación se ha enfocado en cuestiones relacionadas con justicia social, responsabilidad moral y perspectivas de salud. Su más reciente trabajo analiza las cuestiones éticas acerca de la salud global, la sustentabilidad ambiental, la justicia social y la migración global de trabajadores de la salud. Los escritos del Dr. Doyer han sido publicados en diversas revistas y publicaciones por mencionar el Hastings Center Report, Academic Medicine, el Boletín de la Organización Mundial de la Salud, entre otras. Y el día de hoy el doctor este, nos, nos hablará, nos, nos dictará una conferencia sobre aspectos relacionados con bioética ambiental. Thank you very much for being here with us. We're looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to come to Mexico. We had a wonderful seminar this morning and I will give another lecture explanation today and there will be time for questions. Uh, so thank you for all your hospitality in Mexico. I'm going to talk on what I call environmental bioethics. And I will explain the need for a field called environmental bioethics. So if you think of bioethics, the English word bioethics began in 1970. There was a researcher named Van Rensselaer Potter at the University of Wisconsin. And he saw the need to bring together biological knowledge and ethical values. So he coined the term bioethics. There was an older term in German, actually much before 1970, called die Bioethik. Okay? But the English word started in 1970. So Van Rensselaer Potter hoped there would be a field that took biology and its knowledge and combined it with ethical values and analysis. He thought this field should include population growth, the environment, interactions between human beings and the environment, and healthcare too. But at least in the United States, the field bioethics developed differently. Okay? Soon after 1970, there was a center in Washington, D.C. called the Kennedy Institute of Bioethics. And they took the word bioethics, but they focused mostly on medical ethics. And in the United States, most of the focus was on end-of-life decision-making in clinical settings, new technologies like reproductive technologies, new scientific developments like genetics and the human genome. And that's where people focus their ethical attention. What are the ethical issues around human genetics? What are the ethical issues around reproductive technologies? All of that's important, but what got left out were the environmental concerns that were supposed to be part of bioethics. Now this is a story about the United States. In Europe, it's a little different. I think bioethics is broader. And in Mexico, I think the word bioethica includes much more than medical.
medical ethics. So we can come back to that. So why is this a problem that in English or in America, bioethics is very narrow? Well, this is the problem. We have all kinds of environmental problems that are even becoming more serious. So we have climate change, where the temperature is getting hotter, there's more moisture in the atmosphere, and it's changing the very conditions in which people live. We have air pollution, which takes an enormous toll on health. You know that in Mexico City, the air is better than it used to be, but it's still problematic. But in China, it's disastrous. And it's not just uncomfortable, it causes a lot of cardiac disease. Okay? Scarcity of fresh water. I grew up in California, and there is always a struggle over fresh water. There is not enough. And places in Mexico, similar. There's a scarcity of fresh water. I think all over the world, about a third of the people live someplace where there's a scarcity of fresh water. So that's a huge problem. Overfishing. We capture so many fish from the sea that the stocks of fish are getting lower and lower, especially for the big fish. And some fisheries, like cod fishing, have collapsed. Another problem is deforestation, cutting down forests especially the rainforest, of course, in Amazon and Brazil, but also the other forests. And we've seen this problem in Mexico, too. We have an increasing population in the world. Now we have maybe 6.2 billion, but of course it's going to increase to 8 or 9 billion people. And finally, we have increased consumption. That is, at least people in moderate income countries are consuming more, they're buying more items, they're eating more meat. And this puts a bigger load on the environment. So that's why we need a broader bioethics or environmental bioethics. Here's another way to explain the need for bi uh, environmental bioethics. There's something called an ecological footprint you probably understand the idea. It's a measurement of the total environmental impact that a person or a society or a country has. It takes into account everything that I consume. So for example, I drink water, but this is made of glass. I use paper. I have a shirt made of cotton. I have a sweater made of wool. I flew to Mexico on a jet airplane that used it. And if you try to add up everything that I use and all the waste I produce, an important waste is carbon dioxide. <coughs> so actually half of the ecological footprint in rich countries is probably carbon dioxide. So if you do that, we have a measurement called an ecological footprint. And the measurement is in Earths, and I'll explain that. So if you look at the United States of America, the ecological footprint is 4.0 Earths. What that means is if everyone lived like North Americans lived, we would need four Earths to support them, to produce all the material and to absorb all the waste. You see, Japan is much less, Mexico 1.9, almost two Earths. So if everyone lived like Mexicans live, and I know there's great differences between different Mexicans, but the average, we would need two Earths. And there's Costa Rica and India. I now want to say something about health. If you look at the United States, the average life expectancy in the United States is 78 years. So that's what a child born now can expect to live. And that's OK. It's not as good as Japan. Japan is 80, 80. So the average Japanese lives to be 80 years old. That's the longest uh, of any country. 
But now if you look at the ecological footprints, let's look at Costa Rica. In Costa Rica, the life expectancy is the same as the United States, 78 years. But the ecological footprint is much less. So Costa Rica is a better model than the United States. It's a better model than Japan. Why? Because they're getting a good life expectancy from a smaller ecological footprint. So I want to suggest is I used to look at Sweden or Japan because these countries are the leaders in terms of population health. But their ecological footprints are much greater. So maybe we need to think in terms of new models. So I'm suggesting not India, but more like Costa Rica, where there's a low ecological footprint, but a good life expectancy. OK, so those are two ways to try to explain what I think is there's a need to connect narrow bioethics to public health ethics and environmental health ethics. Or we can put this another way. If you have a broad conception of bioethics, like in Mexico, bioethica, then part of it will be medical ethics, but part of it will be environmental ethics, and part of it will be public health. So I want to give one example of where we could begin to work together to connect bioethics, public health ethics, environmental ethics. And the example I picked are natural disasters. So I will give you some images to call the mind. So this is Mexico in 2009. Uh, I think it's in southeast Mexico, around Veracruz region. region. Pardon? But, OK, yeah. This is not a great photograph, but you see the floods. You see the people waiting on the roof to be rescued. This is again, same area, same flood, people escaping the flood. Okay. So that was in 2009. 2010, huge earthquake in Haiti, one of the most deadly earthquakes in the history of human beings. Not the worst, but close. Hundreds of thousands of people killed, many people injured, many people homeless. So you see the destruction. Then you see medical response caring for one of the victims. And it's not just the victims that raise issues. It's the survivors. So here is a six-year-old boy with his one-year-old sister who survived in perfect health. But where is their mother? Where is their father? Perhaps lost in the earthquake. So there's questions of response then. So that's 2010, 2011, Japan, the three disasters. Earthquake, tsunami, the wave, we call it a tsunami, and then, of course, the nuclear meltdown. So you see the force of the water there. You see what it must have been like. That's a quite large ship. And then you see the disaster. But you also see something that's going to be very important from my point of view. See how well the bicycle is working? Okay. So one mode of transportation that works in the disaster is the bicycle. So I want to praise la bicicleta and compare it to this is <laughs> Hurricane Sandy in the United States. These are the famous yellow taxi cabs in New York. Some of you have seen it. They are useless. They're all submerged. Okay. This is the subway in part of New York. This was in Brooklyn. The yellow line is, they say, stand behind the yellow line when the train approaches. Okay. They're both underwater. Okay. Uh, I was in New York during this time. Fortunately, I was in a little higher area, and it was not bad for me. But for others, it was disaster. This is grocery store in New York City, because 
hurricane is coming, you need water, food, everyone by, grabs it, and it's hard to have sharing and solidarity. Okay? So those are the four disasters in the last four years. Okay? Now, what I want to suggest is this is a grid of where we could look for ethical issues. So there could be ethical issues about preparing for natural disasters, responding to it, and recovering from natural disasters. And there could also be ethical issues about people and families, but local associations and communities, ethical issues for healthcare organizations, hospitals, government authorities, and then for larger society and organizations. And I'll give you two examples. That is, if you look at respond and healthcare organizations, one of the ethical issues is what we call triage. People in medicine know this. When many people are injured, you have to put them in priority and decide who you're going to treat first. So anyone who's worked in an emergency room knows that people come in, and there's a very skillful nurse who triages and gives priority to who you're going to treat first. So if I come in with a cut arm, that's bad, but it's different. If I come in with chest pain and a pain down here, it could be a heart attack. So they'll give it higher priority. So when medical organizations responded to the earthquake in Haiti, there were too many people injured. And they had to do triage about who's going to get priority. So that's one ethical issue. But that's familiar in bioethics. Actually, what happened in Japan was unexpected. The problem was at the recovery level for healthcare organizations. They had many elderly people who survived the earthquake and tsunami. And they were living not in their homes, but in shelters. And they were in perfect health. Well, not perfect health. They were older people. And they had chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, cardiac disease, and they needed their usual treatment and medication. And the system was not prepared to deal with that very well. So this is a kind of grid for preparing, responding, recovering to disasters. Now, I'm going to make just four ethical points about looking at disasters and trying to combine environmental bioethics and regular bioethics. So here's my first point. We need to denaturalize natural disasters. What I mean by that is all those disasters I showed you, it's true, something happens in nature. There's an earthquake, there's a tsunami, there's a hurricane. But people die or are injured because of what human beings do or don't do. So it's not just nature, it's what we do. And I'll give you examples. So if you look at the human contribution, that is, people measure storms in the number of years it would take to usually have a storm like that. So the worst storm is a 100-year storm. It's a storm so bad, you expect one of those storms every 100 years. But because of what we're doing to the climate, we're going to have a 100-year storm every 20 years. Okay? So we are actually, human beings, contributing to the natural disasters by creating the conditions. Now, we don't create earthquakes, but we create some of the force of the storms. The second thing we do create is the built environment. Why were there so many deaths in Haiti? Well, it was the earthquake, but no, it's the way they build buildings. And I know it's a poor country, but the construction is very poor, and so they collapsed. So in Japan, there were fewer deaths because of the earthquake. It's a richer country, but also they have higher building standards. Okay? And subways were useless. Taxis were useless. Bicycles worked pretty well. 
that's all part of the built environment. But there's a third thing, the social structures. So we had a terrible hurricane in the United States, Hurricane Katrina, and it hit New Orleans. But the whole world saw who was left behind in the city. It was poor African Americans who didn't have automobiles, didn't have cars. So if you were richer, or more white people, or if you had a car, you were able to escape the hurricane. This is not something about nature. This is something about how we organize society. And finally, human response. That is, how we respond to these natural disasters also determines who's injured, how many people are injured, how catastrophic it is. So once we denaturalize disasters, then there's room to discuss ethics. Because if there's simply nothing we can do about it, if it's all nature and out of our hands, then it's not really an ethical issue. But if we can affect the conditions, the built environment, the social structures, the response to the problem, then there are ethical issues. Second point, vulnerability and justice. So we are all vulnerable as human beings to natural disasters. So if there is a terrible earthquake in the next few minutes in Mexico City, we could all be killed. Or if we're living near the coast and there's a hurricane, we could be flooded and killed. So as human beings, we are vulnerable. But we are not equally vulnerable. There's also structural vulnerability. And I mentioned that. In the United States, you are more vulnerable if you were poor, African American, or you didn't own a car. And so the vulnerability it depends on all those things which we call social determinants of health. So you could be more vulnerable because you were poor, because of the kind of housing you lived in, because of you're an ethnic group or racial background. Women in some circumstances could be more vulnerable. Older people could be more vulnerable. Small children could be more vulnerable. So vulnerability depends on social structures. And that raises the issue of justice. That is, we could try to create societies where people are less vulnerable or the vulnerability doesn't depend on all of these factors. So what this calls for is both solidarity, which is a very important value, I think, uh, especially in other countries. It gets neglected in the United States, but there's much discussion of it in other countries, and there's a need for it in all countries. That is, identifying with people. And it turns out that when disasters first happen, there's a great outpouring of solidarity. I really think there is a good response. So I'm sure when there were the floods in 2009, the Mexican government, the army, the people responded in a very generous way. But that goes away after time. So we also need justice. That is, we need to make sure that different groups are not structurally vulnerable to natural disasters. So my third point, the questions of ethics and then the questions of vulnerability and justice lead to the questions of responsibility. I think we have some responsibility for justice, for trying to create a more just society. We do this because we participate in society, and so we actually benefit from and participate in the social structures that make some groups more, more vulnerable than others. So I think we have a responsibility to address that. Second point, I worry that in the future there's going to be more and more environmental refugees. So you know in the past in Mexico how many refugees you got from Central America. There were wars in Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua. 
And in all those wars, I'm sorry to say, the United States played a part that exacerbated the wars, okay? But now, I think from what I've read about environment and climate change, there will be more environmental refugees because of flooding and hurricanes, people whose places of living, villages have been destroyed, and they become refugees. And they will not have standing under international law. Because international law recognizes a refugee as someone who's fleeing a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, or background, or political beliefs, and so on. That's not environmental refugees. So I think we have a big ethical issue of how we're going to respond in the future, and who's responsible for environmental refugees. Because if I'm right, all of those countries that contributed a lot to global warming have contributed to the problem. But the hurricanes are going to strike Central America. And the refugees are going to come to the country next door, which is like Mexico. It's a little like the war in Syria. Syria, the refugees go to the neighboring country, Turkey, Afghanistan, and so on. Okay? The last thing is I think we need to prepare for environmental disasters by taking responsibility for civic and neighborly concern. What I mean is, it makes a big difference in a disaster if your neighbors and people in your community are looking out for each other. So there are many elderly people, some of them live alone, and if people know about them and care for them, they won't be victims in natural disasters. But if everyone lives isolated lives, then there could be more victims. So here's really my last point. The ethical task before us, if we take environmental bioethics seriously, it's to create healthy communities. But that's not all. We don't want just communities with a high average level of health. We want just communities. And we look more in bioethics at health inequalities, the big differences in health between different groups. But that's not enough. That's the first two steps in traditional bioethics, health and even justice. We need to create communities that are healthy, just, and sustainable. That is, environmentally, these communities are living ecologically at a lower ecological footprint. And it's not just sustainable, but I fear there's going to be disasters and problems, as there's always been. So we need to build communities that are resilient. And what that means is if there's a problem, they come back and they can reestablish themselves. They can deal with problems and respond. So some children are resilient, right? That is, they fall down, they get up, they carry on, they fail something in school, they learn, they get better, they go on. But we need communities, too, that are resilient, so that if there's scarcities of water, if there's floods too much, if there's problems, these communities can reestablish themselves and flourish again. So that's my plea, is that there's a need to think of this environmental bioethics. Natural disasters is one area we could look at, but there are also many more. So I encourage all of you who work in Mexico to keep in your hearts this big picture of bioethics, which includes medical ethics, but includes public health ethics. It includes environmental ethics. Because I think the future demands it of us, and I think our children and grandchildren will thank us for us, thank us, if we keep in mind a broad, big bioethics. So thank you for your attention, and we'll have questions when we have time. But first,
That's okay. <laughs> That's it's better okay. than my Spanish. Okay. <laughs> you say that here in Mexico, um, there is a concept of bio, bio, bioethic uh, more included, mm -hmm. but I think this is not really because my impression is uh, it's more medical ethic than other topics. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, here uh, there is not one area for these topics. Oh. No? There, there is uh, one area for the hospital, for the, but this is for research, but I think this topic is not really evident. So I would like to know what is the strategy for many, for example, what institution or the state, what is the form or to work this topic in a political, you know, what, uh, for example, in the United States or in, in New York, what is the, I don't know, the strategy, the strategy yeah. for this topic. Okay. Very good question. For the recording, can they hear, hear her question, or do I need to repeat it? No, uh, we can. We, we can hear it. Yeah. Okay, good. So my hope was that in Mexico, bioethics is this broad area. And that hope was they gave me an introduction to con bioethica. Yeah. And in the statement, they have this very inclusive view of bioethics. But you're right, if you look at the actual research projects, or if you look cynically, where do they put the money? The money is in medical ethics, or research ethics, too. And in the United States, a lot of the money went to genomic medicine, ethical issues about genomic medicine. That's important, okay? But we need ethical issues about these other topics, too. So your question is, how do we do it? So one way we do it is through education, okay? So when I teach a bioethics course to young students, I start with ethical issues in the doctor-patient relationship. You know, about confidentiality, truth-telling. And then I get to ethical issues about, uh, you know, end of life. And then ethical issues in the healthcare system. And then I get to ethical issues in public health, but I don't stop. Then I go ethical issues in global health, the whole world, migrants, and I don't stop. I go ethical issues about how we relate to nature and these sorts of issues, how you respond to disasters, and finally the attitude we should take to the natural world. And what I found is the students understand. They think, oh yeah, all that's bioethics. So we could change the education. Okay, and how might we do that? Well, there's different ways, but you know, we could talk to healthcare workers, like, do you see people coming in who are sick because of bad water, okay? Or do you see people, we see this all the time, children having asthma attacks because of air pollution? They have asthma, but it's much worse depending on where they live in the city and what happens. So there's ways to bring in the ethical issues, even in medical ethics, that are really environmental. Okay? Another thing is I think we have to do more research, okay? So we're gonna have, in June of 2014, the World Congress here in Mexico. We have to, people who work in bioethics, have to make sure that there's some topics like this on the program. And then finally, if you want to do research, I think you could do good research. Like, I don't know, I bet some of the first people who respond to natural disasters are doc Well, the first people are really neighbors and family. And then doctors respond. And then the army responds, right? So in Mexico, when there's a disaster, they call it the army. I would like to talk to the people in the army and say, well, you know, what ethical issues do you face? What is it? And that would be really good research for someone 
Someone here to do. So, sorry, that was a long answer. So what can we do? Change education, point out the problems, change research, put some of these things on the agenda, on the program. Thank you for the question. Doctor, una pregunta más. Uh, José Manuel le traducirá. <laughs> ¿De, qué manera, sí, uh, ¿De qué manera considera que la aplicación de la bioética y sus principios pueden contribuir a mejorar la salud de las poblaciones vulnerables? ¿En qué manera crees que los principios principales pueden ayudar a la salud de las poblaciones vulnerables? It's a good question. Um, I'll give you two answers. I think bioethical principles that stress justice and social justice, they look at vulnerability. So even in research ethics, we look, there are certain subjects that are particularly vulnerable, children, prisoners, pregnant women, maybe we made them too vulnerable. We should say, you know, they're adults too. So I think we need to look at the same thing of vulnerability in terms of justice. What does that demand? And also solidarity, I think, could be an ethical principle, you know? So that's one answer. I think the other thing is to look at the problems. When I do bioethics, I don't start with the principles, I start more with the problems. And then ask, what kind of concepts or discourse do we need to deal with these problems? Um, so what would be an example? Um, so a public health problem is there's flooding, and then there's disease after the flooding. And what kind of ethical discourse or concepts do we need to address the ethical issues of who's most vulnerable, how do they respond, how could we empower them? So it's a good question, and that's the best answer I can give you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. So, I have a question, and maybe a technical one. Uh, I see you are uh, speaking about two great communities. Uh, I have that about, about that uh, notion of community that you manage, because I think it is not um, new to communitarian. Uh, what kind of society for good we are talking about? Well, it's a very good question. So the question is about what do I mean by community here? And what kind of community do I have in mind? Do I want to go back to a traditional community or not? Uh, and we talked a little about this before. So what I'll say this is, I start with the problem, okay? The problem is we have natural disasters, and they're not natural. We cause them, and some groups are more vulnerable. So I think, what kind of society do we need to create in order to be less vulnerable to natural disasters and to be just? And I think we need a community where people know their neighbors and care for their neighbors more than in the United States. So I'll give you an example. So I lived in New York City, one of those very tall apartment buildings. And you see your neighbors in the elevator going up, OK? But you're not always close to your neighbors. The one exception was I had a neighbor who was very elderly, 85 years old. And she lived alone. And she did OK, but she needed some help, like to go to the doctor and so on. So I don't think the government I think we need neighbors and associations to actually help. Now, none of that requires a community where we have the same beliefs. We don't have to have the same religion. We don't have to have exactly the same political view. We don't 
certainly have to have the same view on what's the role of women and so on. So it can be a modern pluralistic society, but somehow, if we're going to respond to these disasters, we need to know and care more about the other. That's the best I can say. <laughs> Do you want to say more? Um, no? How to achieve that? <laughs> Okay. Uh, some of us here in Mexico are trying to open the bioethics analysis beyond the traditional principles. So which other uh, principles do you consider are important to be a more inclusive view of bioethics? Okay, yeah. So I admire your attempt. I think you should not just adopt the four principles, okay? So what should you do? That is, if you're talking about principles, you can add others. You can say, well, it's not just justice, it's solidarity. And it's not just solidarity, it's being good neighbors, and so on. But I think you should limit yourself to principles. It's not, we need more principles. I think maybe you need different kinds of approaches. So here's two suggestions. One is put the principles aside for a while and look at the problems, okay? So we heard about the problem of migration, the problem of natural disasters, and then think, well, what do we need to change in institutions or in ourselves to respond to the problems, okay? So I think that would really open things up. Or here's a, a, a third way. So one way was principles, the other is problems. Look at the habits, qualities, or virtues we have or don't have. So say, the problem is migration. Well, what kind of habits or virtues or ways of thinking do we need to develop in order to respond to the problem of migration or natural disasters? What kind of ways of thinking or virtues do we need to develop to respond to disasters? And I'll give you an example from the United States, and you can compare Mexico. When there's a disaster, like Hurricane Tr Katrina, American people are very generous, okay? They give money to Red Cross. I know doctors drive to the area, they volunteer. I know medical students help, doctors. Whenever there's a disaster, the doctors and nurses report right to the hospital, okay? They're willing to work. So I was in New York when there was the bombing on September 11th, 2001. All the doctors went. You know, as soon as they heard it, they went straight to the hospital. They were just waiting to help people. So I think that's good. But what's missing? A week or two or a month later, we forget about all the vulnerable people. So what needs to change is habits or virtues or ways of thinking. Okay? So you know, I'll ask you a question. It's fair. Not just you, but everyone. So you've had disasters in Mexico. Uh, 2009, the floods, but earthquakes prior to that. So, how do Mexicans respond? Do you get this outpouring of generosity and solidarity, and then it dies out? Or? Our people is very generous and yeah. give more than they can do. Yeah. That 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 one of the. Uh, uh, atmosphere that we feel in when we have the crash in, in 985 and in, in this epoch and, and recently in, in, the, in the west coast near Oaxaca and, yeah. and Guerrero, yeah. Guerrero in the south of our country uh, was a, one of the biggest uh, rain season and yes recently yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Torres, uh, <laughs> two months ago, 
He was inside in his semi-like nice man, and he can talk only one time to say, I can go to work. <laughs> because I'm in the middle of the of a problem. Yeah. Um, but but his community, all the people around him make a nice reaction, a nice human reaction. That's where we feel him all the time because we have many, many troubles. And suddenly we listen in different parts of our country the same kind of, of uh, reaction. So that's the good part. So I think disasters really do bring out these good qualities. And doctors are very dedicated. So that's part of the answer, different approaches. But now let me ask you an awkward question as your friend. So what's missing in Mexico when there's a disaster? What's the shortcomings of people or institutions? That is, you know, like I said in the United States, it's we allow this structural injustice. You know. That's a, I know it's a big question. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so I think I think it's kind of. Uh, governmental problem as well as a society problem. We, I think we can see that there is a lot of lack of planning when building houses yeah. or uh, build nice hotels in places where it was like a river before. Yeah. So we got that kind of problems as well. People who has a, a low income is the people who suffer more than the other. Yes, in Acapulco, there is a, it's a nice place to, to be as a tourist. There were a lot of airplanes taking people from Mexico City, I mean, to Acapulco, to Mexico City. But the people that live there, they're still in a quite critical condition. Yeah. So it's quite a... Well, that's a very insightful answer. So two things. There's a lack of good planning. We just, if someone has the money and they want to build a nice hotel, even though this is environmentally very important, they just do it, okay? And second thing is that the people who are most vulnerable are always, in every society, the poor people. So they are prone to earthquakes, flooding, disasters, and their houses are often very poorly built. So this gives you part, a different way to approach bioethics, is to think, start with the problems and say, well, what are the good qualities and what's lacking institutionally or in people's hearts? Yeah. Well, thank you. We've actually turned this into a real seminar instead of a lecture. <laughs> I'm asking you questions. Uh, maybe I'll ask you more questions. Yeah, please. Yeah. First, thank you for the time. This is my pleasure and, have, and an honor to see you. But uh, it's a small question. It's, it's so near to another question of my, of my partners. It's just, in your opinion, which is the road to make a social diabetic? Mm -hmm. it's a good thing. It's a good question. I'm not sure I have a good answer. So I think part of it is education, you know, so really emphasize the social problems belong in bioethics, whether it's migration. So I'll give you an example. In the United States, we have immigrants from all over the world, and they come to the hospital, and we treat them, but we don't have enough foreign language interpreters. So sometimes what they do, and this is not good, but a couple comes in, and the woman is the patient, and she doesn't speak English, but the husband speaks, uh, you know, Urdu and English, then we ask the husband. It's very bad practice, right? You know enough about medicine, confidentiality, giving truthful information. So I think one way is we emphasize in bioethics education the problems that they have social basis. Second, we do more than that. We require of students some action. Students want to take action. So if there's a disaster and doctors are responding, let's take the medical students. Let's take the nursing students. We'll supervise them. 
but they should have that experience. And I think that really changes them, okay? Um, the second part is I think when we write about bioethics, we need to write about the social problems. So there's a famous journal, the Hastings Center Report, and they have case studies, and they have different people write commentaries on the cases. And almost everyone sends in cases from clinical medicine. And I'm one of the few people I send in cases that are these sort of big social issues, you know, like how to respond to disasters and so on. And they're willing, but more of us have to do that. Uh, the last thing is how to change institutional bioethics. You know, the, the grant money, the mission statement, what the different centers in Mexico are doing, which are, have a master's degree in bioethics and so on. I think that's harder, but I think there's some people willing, like I think uh, Dr. Manuel, who is the Chavez, is willing to take a broader view, okay? So we can, there's hope. <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. Doctor, do you think we must to, to begin the, the, the bioethical education in the, in the secondary school, for example? Because I, I think we, if you, we, we want to, construct, to build a new society with this point of view, very critical point of the catastrophes, or possible catastrophes of our Earth, at what time is it better, the, the, the best time for beginning to, to, to give the education? I think the people, the child, when they have a 12, 13 years old, is when his brains, his mind begin to change and, and, and begin to know what's bad, what's, what's good, begin to understand what's the, the meaning of life and the meaning of justice. And probably if we introduce not all the bioethics, but, but some recreations about the principal point of view of see the light with this, with this bioethic emphasis. I, I think, but I, I, I would like to know what you think about this early education in bioethics. Yeah. I think it's a brilliant idea, okay? I sometimes worry that uh, younger people, they have problems, but they are a source of change for the better in society. And we're not utilizing these younger people. So education at a younger age is very promising, okay? Now, how could you do that? One way we did that, and you could do similar or better things here in Mexico, is during the summer, we had a program for science teachers in high school, junior high school, secondary. We said, you teach science, but if you teach biology, you teach chemistry, there's global warming, there's this, why don't you also include an ethical issue about whatever you're teaching? So if you're teaching genetics, there's ethical issues about genetics. If you're social science and you're teaching migration, there's ethical issues about migration. The teachers are willing to do it, and the students are very interested, but teachers feel a little inadequate. So if we could run workshops or training for uh, primary teachers or high school teachers, I think they would welcome that. So that's one idea. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, some students have changed their school, you know, so it, that some schools have become more environmentally friendly. So instead of plastic bottle of water, they have this, you know? It's environmentally better and so on. So I think there is opportunity. I think uh, when we teach younger students, though, it shouldn't just be a debate and polarizing. I mean, if we can combine it with some activity, it's going to be very meaningful. So even for our, our nursing and medical students, when they get to work with refugees, they get to work with patients who speak, don't speak English, when they get to respond to a disaster, it really has a deep educational effect. It's not just an idea up here. 
So you have a good idea, and you know, maybe you could do more. Like, uh, I learned this about to work with this, oh. this people, yeah, this friends, yeah. And sometimes it can start simple. That is, if you know a school teacher, you would say, well, could I come, you know, give one class on natural disasters? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My advice. Yes. Hey, well, I can say more Henry, more Venture, more America. <laughs> okay. And uh, for those lawyer, we appreciate too much your time and the talk about the advantages of the bioethics. And the wonderful is uh, is the same concepts we carry on in the national bioethics in Mexico. Oh. Uh, on behalf of the of bioethics, thank you, we say Thank you, Dr. Doyle, and give you a diploma of your speech. Mm. And we hope to see you again next year in the Third World Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just say thank you. I am coming back. Okay. I remember one expression in Spanish, nos vemos. <laughs> we will see each other in Mexico in... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>